keep us, oh, what am I saying? Let us know in the comments. Let us know how much you hate us in the comments, everybody. <laughs> Not that we need to remind you. Yeah, okay, one more try. <laughs>
yeah, just great pedaling. The suspension, like the overall tune of that, um, the shock on that Nomad is pretty impressive. So yeah, I think the altitude and the Nomad are the two that like, I can just hop on, ride any trail and just feel really comfortable. Okay, so let's talk about the very orange Trek Slash. There's tons of Trek Slashes out there. People love them for enduro bikes and doing all that, all sorts of that kind of stuff. You've ridden the previous one. Now you've got the new one. What's different on the trail? What's different that yeah. matters? I mean, I think the geometry changes are gonna be, people will notice them if you rode the previous one and the new one. Um, it's not so dramatic that you're not gonna feel like you're on a completely unfamiliar bike, but you do notice the extra length. It is a little bit slacker, um, just kind of in line with what we're seeing for a modern bike these days. They steepen that seat tube angle up just a little bit. So, it, you know, your climbing position is a little better. It's still a little, a little more stretched out than I would like to see. Um, it's, you know, we're starting just, because it has a fairly long reach, you know, I ended up slamming the seat more forward than on some of the other bikes. Um, not the end of the world, but you know, if you're looking at all the little details, that's one detail. I think they could go a little steeper with that seat angle, that shock that they put on there. It's proprietary for now to that bike. And usually proprietary shocks, sometimes it's like, you get a little nervous about those, but this one worked very well. It's really adjustable. So um, yeah, overall, it's more of a story of refinement rather than like a full overhaul of the slash, but it sits in that spot pretty well. And they also added a size. They added a medium large size, which I don't think was there before. So now you can really like pick the reach number and fit that you want. So if you don't have super long high speed descents and you want something to wiggle a little better, you can go down a size potentially. Did you just say if you want something to wiggle a little better? Yeah, you want a more wiggly bike? Yeah. Although that bike is not wiggly. It's very stiff. I'd say it's probably the stiffest. Casimir, the tubes are like, they're huge. They're like the size of my thigh. It also has yeah. the longest down tube protector I've ever seen. Yeah, it is removable, that down tube, down tube protector, but that's good because shuttling, that part is actually, that part of the frame is actually pretty thin. Um, so it's good that there's a big protector there because if you hit a bump on a, with your pickup truck and smash it without that protector, you could potentially do some damage. So Kaz, I know that all you really want to do out there is ride skinnies and do shuttle runs, but we got to talk about climbing a little bit. So I'm going to do the efficiency test, but how do they feel on the trail to you? Which one, if someone wanted a big free ridey enduro -y bike, but they still cared about pedaling, is there one that you would recommend and one that you wouldn't? Yeah, I think my top picks there would be that propane spin drift. The 180 yeah. mil bike. Yeah, 180 mil, but it has a dual link uh, suspension layout that works really well. So it just feels efficient. You know, like you can, it has a climb switch on that shock, but you don't really need it if you don't want. And yeah, it pedals really well. And then also in that same category, I'd put that Nomad, another dual link suspension design. Um, and I think that they can just get that efficiency a little bit more than like say even the altitude, it's, it's a fairly active climber. It's not horrible, but you do notice more suspension movement. Um, and the slash too, you know, like they, none of them were big wallowy messes. Like you never, I never felt like I wanted to just push the bike up the hill like the old days, um, but <laughs> which is good. So like we're getting to a good spot with how bikes climb, but I will put the propane and the Nomad at the top as far as climbing uh, efficiency performance goes. Question for you, you said climb switch. No one's watching, no one's gonna judge you. You're riding these bikes up a steep gravel road. Are you locking these bikes out? Oh yeah, a lot of times, yeah. I'm judging you. Why not? It's there. I'm just going to go and then it's way easier to pedal. <laughs> Which one didn't you like? I think that's sure. And it's not that it's a bad climber as far as efficiency goes, like as far as the, the rear end staying pretty calm, it does that. It actually doesn't have a climb switch on it, so you can't do anything there. Um, but it's so heavy. It's 37 pounds and I know weight doesn't matter, but like 37 pounds, there's downhill bikes, aluminum downhill bikes that weigh the exact same as this bike. So that makes it feel like a decent effort, like just kind of grinding up the hill. The climbing position is comfortable, but. We put Kush cores in it, Kaz, for the huck to flat. Just, do you want yeah. it back like that? Do you want me to send it back to you with Kush cores in it for all your yeah. climbing? It was too light. I need some winter weight training. So if you send it back that way. Yeah, so that bike, like, I mean, it is nice. That one does have one of the steeper seat angles. And I'd say like actual position felt the nicest or one of the nicest, like nice and upright, kind of how I want to be while climbing, but it's hard getting away from that weight and just the overall like, grinding and you've got the idler pulley, which it's kind of a more of a mental thing, but sometimes you hear it grinding a little bit and you're like, I'm probably could be more efficient. All right, let's wrap this up with surprises. Which bike surprised you in a good way and which bike surprised you in a bad way, if any? I think the Nomad surprised me. Like I've, I've ridden the last four generations or I mean a bunch of generations of Nomad. So I kind of thought I knew how it would feel and it did, but it was better than I remembered. Like that bike, I had my slowest time on it, but I don't know, maybe I just forgot how to ride little wheels for a couple minutes, but. Isn't it amazing that we get to ride like all these generations of the same platform and we can compare the evolution of these things. Yeah. We need to get like all evolutions of a Nomad in 
yeah. then like do like a week test session on all evolutions of the Nomad. Like, I know it wouldn't be testing new bikes, but I think people would love to see that. I think that'd be super interesting. Yeah, it could be fun. I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, like, if I'm if my memories are right of the other generations, for sure. Okay, so tell me about the bike that surprised you in a bad way now, if there is one. I think that Shore is the one I was a little, just kind of, a little disappointed in. Not that, I do think it has a market, and there are going to people that are going to love it. Like, it's big and burly. Um, maybe the wheels are a little soft. I think those rims aren't, aren't super tough. I got a pretty good dent in the rear. Um, but otherwise, as a park bike or something you just want to smash with, it can, it fits that bill, but it doesn't, I think it just didn't meet my preconceived notions of it being like super ground hugging and just, you know, wasn't quite what I expected. Which one would you buy for where you live in Bellingham? Yeah, money was no object. We do have a value section coming up where we talk about which bikes are good values and which ones aren't. But if I didn't have to worry about money at all, I think that that altitude would probably be the one I'd go with. And I would run it the same way that the Rocky team guys are with a angle set, a negative one angle set in the neutral position. So that would make all the numbers work the way exactly the way I want. You want them, you want the bike slacker even. Well, it has the, the ride nine, so there's like nine positions. But if you put it in the neutral position with a negative one angle set, it gives it a 64 degree head angle and a 480 mil reach, which I found is kind of like my sweet spot of numbers, at least this year. So yeah, that would make it a little bit slacker without dropping the reach down. That's what I would do. Rocky Mountain, if you're listening, send Chasm or that stuff. Yeah, but yeah, that would be sweet. And then I think the, the John tube storage of the slash on every bike ever just kind of like, you know, Specialized started that. But now if all companies can start putting holes in the down tubes, um, that'd be cool too. All right, Kaz, a lot of that sounded like fence sitting to me, but you eventually settled on the altitude. How does that compare to last year's field test winner, which was the Specialized Enduro? Uh, they're actually pretty different bikes, which is interesting because the altitude, it's a little less travel, 160 versus the 170 on the Enduro, but the Enduro feels even more uh, it just has a bigger presence on the trail. Like the Enduro would be a great bike park bike where the altitude can do that, but it wouldn't be my pick if I had like planning a bunch of lift serve riding for a season. Like that Enduro still holds up well. Like it's, you know, it's a year on and it still would sit right in this category with all these bikes. So yeah, I don't know which one I would pick between those two. It would kind of depend what I was doing. Like I think that altitude makes a good all around bike and it can also be a good all around race bike if you, depending on where you're racing. And the Enduro can be a good race bike for like gnarlier tracks, um, that's a hard one. I don't know if one doesn't necessarily beat the other. They have different feels. And it kind of depends what you're looking to do. Get off the fence, Kaz. I don't know which I would pick. I think I'll go with the altitude because the fit for me felt a little bit better than the Enduro. The Enduro, the seat angle is still a little slack. So I felt a little stretched out on the S4 size, but I, you can't go wrong with either one. What, do you think there's something, there are moves out there that you would ride on the Enduro that you wouldn't ride on that altitude? Yeah, probably not. I don't think, I think either bike could do just about anything, but I do think that when you're, when you're on the Enduro, like you feel a little more, just feel a little more confident. It's a little slacker. It just has a, like the way that that suspension kind of has you feeling nice and low and hugging the ground. Like, yeah, kind of now I want to ride the Enduro some more. So, yeah. <laughs> I think I still have the Enduro up here in Squamish. I'm not going to send it to you. I'm still enjoying it. I know you're not. Yeah, the Enduro is still a really good bike. It hasn't lost anything. Like it would have been right in the mix with these ones, which is cool. All right, Levy, I know you've been riding a lot of trail bikes. It's probably time to go back to your free ride routes. So out of the five bikes I've got, which one do you want to spend some time on? From what you said and knowing their bikes fairly well, I would probably lean towards that altitude, to be honest. It sounds fairly well-rounded. Uh, it's not going to hold me back on the descents and it's not going to hold me back that much on the climb. So there you go. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a wrap on our Enduro free ride bike round table. Let us know what you think of our picks. Are we out to lunch? Spot on the money. Drop a line and stay tuned for even more content from the Pink Bike Field Test.